Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verses 137 through 140, which read as follows. Yo dandena adandesu apaduthesu dusati dasanamanya tarangthanang kippameva nigajati Vedanang parusang janing sarirasa vabedanang karukang vapi abadhang chitta khepang vapapune Rajato va upasagang abhakkhanang vadha darunang Parikhayang va nyatinang bhoganang va pabhangurang Atta, atta vasa agarani agi dahati pavako kayasa beda dupanyo nirayang so pabajati. It's a lot. It's just simple, but it's simple, easy to understand and translate. Um, the first verse is whoever punishes someone who doesn't punish or those who don't punish meaning those who if someone those who attack those who don't who aren't violent someone who is violent towards those who are not violent apadute sudusati who uh, is wicked towards those who are not who is evil towards those who are not evil Tasanamanyatarangtanang in regards to one of ten, one or another of ten states. Kipameva nigajati. Such a person comes to one or another of ten things. Uh, so someone who is evil, not just an evil person, but evil towards those who are good, those who are kind, those who have never done anything wicked towards oneself one of ten things, or maybe more than one of ten things, but these ten things, and maybe more than these ten, but these are ten good examples of things that happen. So, number one, Vedanang Parusang Janing, they experience great and sharp and terrible pain. Sarirasa, number two, Sarirasa Vedanang, injury. And their body is broken up. And they break a bone or something like that, so they come to harm in the uh, in the body. Karukang wapi abadang number three, uh, they experience great great sickness, harsh or terrible sickness. Number four, jitta ke pangwa papune, or they come to the breaking up of their mind, the destruction of their mind. They lose their mind, insanity. Rajato va upasagang number six, right? One, two, three, no, number five. Uh, they come to some problem or some uh, danger from the king, from the government, from the law. Abakanang va darunang number six. Uh, they experience harsh slander, abakanam. People will say bad things about them. Uh, number seven, parikayang wa nyatinang. They lose their relatives. Boganang wa pabangurang. Eight, they lose wealth. Nine, Atavasa agarani agidahati pavako, or their house is destroyed by fire. Their possessions are destroyed. And number ten, kayasa beda dupanyo nirayang sopapanjati. At the breakup of the body, this person, this foolish person, person with poor wisdom, weak wisdom, 
nirayang sulpapajati, and such a person arises in hell. Number ten, they go to hell. So this is clearly a teaching about karma. What's it about? Well, the story goes, this is about the death of Mahamogalana. Mahamogalana was one of the Buddha's chief disciples. He was a great, great being who was responsible for some of the teaching that we have in the Tipitaka. He was responsible for um, supporting a great number of people in their, their, their quest for enlightenment. Him, between him and Sariputta. Sariputta was the other chief disciple of the Buddha. And the story is that Sariputta was like a mother in that he would bring newcomers to understand the basics of the Dhamma and then he would send them on to Moggallana who would uh, help them further cultivate their practice. And they worked together in this way. So he's one of the many unsung heroes of Buddhism. We don't hear in modern times, too much talk about him, but if you learn in Buddhism in depth, you, you get a sense that he was a historic figure, historic as any any Buddhist figure can be from that time, who uh, did a lot for spreading and, and passing on the Buddhist teaching. But we have a story here, believe it or not, about his death, and that his death was somewhat violent. Moggallana had incredible magical powers. This was one of the great things about him, that he had great mental fortitude and was able to alter and modify the laws of physics. He could fly, he could read people's minds, he could create images, telekinesis, all sorts of magical powers. This is how the, the stories go, believe it or not. So the story goes, um, the short story goes that um, in the time of the Buddha, of course, as the Buddha taught, and he taught for 45 years, his teaching became quite popular. And as a result, other teachers, and there were other teachers at the time, became less popular and found that at least a portion of their followers were leaving them to go and follow after this upstart youngster actually because he be the Buddha began teaching at 35 and um, so for, for some time at least he was significantly younger than many of the te his contemporary the contemporary teachers the, his contemporaries and so they were not so the others were not so pleased and of course not all of the other teachers at the time of the Buddha were, were particularly ethical Many of them would have been corrupt and simply feeding off of the um, support of lay people without actually providing any uh, benefit or any, any great service. And so they were jealous and um, obsessed with their own fortune and greedy for their own um, supporters and, and followers and so on, right? And so they, one day they gathered together and, and tried to find a reason and, and a, a reason for why the Buddha was able to gain so many followers. And they came up with the idea that it was because of Mahamogalana, that Mahamogalana's magical powers were actually the main reason why the Buddha was so popular, because he performed all these, people knew that he had all these magical powers. And so there is something to that, honestly. Uh, foolish people tend to be attracted. Foolish people meaning simple people, people who, um, it's, I mean, it's not exactly pejorative, but people whose, whose spiritual understanding is somewhat limited. Um, so, so simple ordinary folk who don't really have a strong grasp of what's important and what's not important will tend to gravitate towards parlor tricks, magical powers. And so, you get this even even in modern times that any monk who is thought to have magical powers will actually get a significant um, number of followers simply for the fact that they are able to perform magical powers often because there's a belief that 
they can perform magical power, magic to to cure or to protect to provide blessings and protection rather than actually because they can provide wisdom and understanding right which is really the true reason why the Buddha became so incredibly popular. So they they they're barking up the wrong tree in 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 a sense, but on a superficial level, there, this would have been the obvious answer because it appears that the the general populace, the people who don't really know any better, are are flocking to the Buddha because of these these magic the magic that he's, he and his disciples are able to perform. But it's certainly not why, in the long run, because of course this sort of faith is fickle and and um, not particularly based based in in fact. Uh, and over the long run, it's, you, there's much more of a cohesive sort of religion, I suppose, that comes from teaching, that comes from wisdom. Anyway, this is what they came up with, and so they thought, well. If he were gone, if it weren't for him, we'd be fine, you know. Um, specifically, they, the Mogalana, uh, Mogalana is able to tell people, they say, uh, who has been reborn in hell and who has been reborn in heaven and what they did. And, and so as a result, people are, uh, they, you know, they want to know where their relatives went, I guess. Um, Anyway, the, the tricks that the, the magic that Moglana is apparently able to perform is bringing people to him and to the Buddha. And they say, so if we can get rid of him, you know, off this guy, yeah, we'll, we'll be back in glory. The Buddha won't have any, any support. I mean, it, it seems somewhat simplistic, and I imagine it probably went more like, well, if we get rid of him, it would, it would significantly because we can't get anywhere near the Buddha, but if we got rid of one of his chief disciples, well, that would be a good start anyway. don't suppose they were naive enough to think that Moggallana was the only thing. But they conceived of this incredible evil intention that they should kill Maha Moggallana or have him killed. And so they got together money from their supporters and formed a plot to kill him. They found these wandering mercenaries or bandits and they gave them a thousand gold coins to kill him. Now Mahamogalana had great magical power and this is interesting whether or not you believe in the magical power it's interesting how this is worded and how it's it'll be interesting for sort of the lesson that comes from this which there is I think a significant lesson maybe more than one. Um, is that the elder was able, Mahamogalana was able to escape using magical power. And he was able to escape for two months. They hounded him. And every time they came to his kuti, he was able to escape using magical means. But in the third month, he, whether he resigned himself to his death or whether it's simply, it could even be deeper than that, in the sense that his, resign, his resigning himself or his decision not to use magic to protect himself was a result of what we'll see is, is the workings of karma. Um, and I would, I would argue that there's something to that, that the choices we make are affected by our karma. Even though he was enlightened, uh, there's a sense that the external, physical, and, and maybe even the brain, you know, uh, in some sense conspires against him. Not that it's a problem for him, because he's fully, fully uh, at peace with this. But at any rate, he decides not to, and because the wording is somewhat ambiguous, but he decides not to, uh, not to escape. He doesn't use his magical powers. Because of the, but it says because of the ripening of his karma, he makes this decision. And so they caught him. And when these bandits caught him, they beat him, and it says in the English anyway, it says they tore him limb from limb and pounded his bones until they were as small as grains of rice. 
And then thinking to themselves that he was dead, they left him there. Uh, no, they tossed his bones in the bushes and went on their way. Thing is, Mahamogalana did still have great magical power and he was able to uh, preserve his life force. And there's something about when you die, the mind still being active. So it's, there's a potential for the mind a being able to bring the body back together. This is, you know, these legends or, or myths or whatever, ghost stories about animated corpses and that kind of thing. Um, there is a sense that that's possible even after the body is uh, not medically able to support uh, life. The mind is in certain extreme instances, especially with people like Mahamogalana, who had great magical power, to reanimate it. And I believe this all or not, it's not really important. But uh, at any rate, he went to see the Buddha, and he asked, per, or he, he informed the Buddha that he was passing away. And the Buddha asked that before he leave, he'd, he'd give one last teaching, which Mogalana did. After giving that teaching, he passed away entered into Parinibbana. Now the aftermath of this is, of course, that there was great uh, distress and, and sadness among Buddhist the Buddhist followers. And and even the general populace. Of course, there would have been a funeral and the monks would have observed some period of reflection. Uh, the king, King Ajatasattu, actually um, sent out spies to try and find these guys, found them, had them tortured and killed, and along with the uh, heretics, the, the guys of, the, of another religion who instigated who, or who paid for the killing, brought them all together, had them burnt and, and killed in a very horrible manner. And that was that. So everybody dies. And the monks got together, and of course they could understand why all these ascetics had been killed, but the question is, why did, the Mo why did Mogalana die in the first place? And they had this thought come up that Mogalana didn't deserve it, right? He was a great being, perfectly pure, and never uh, a negative thought towards anyone. Well, the Buddha found out what they were talking about. He asked them, what are you talking about? And they told him, and he said, Monks, of course, in, the, in this life, from what you can see, he doesn't deserve it. But samsara is much um, more complicated than that. And as a matter of fact, the manner of death was in exact conformity with the deed he committed in a previous state of existence. And the monks asked, well, what did, he do? what did he do? And this is a famous story. The story goes that in a past life, um, well, Mogalana was a young lad, or the guy who was to become Mogalana was a young lad, and his parents were persistent, persistent in getting him to choose a wife. And because he was somewhat um, uninterested in having a wife, they chose one for him and they didn't do a very good job choosing. They chose a woman who turned out to be rather cruel and, and uh, you know, vindictive. And when she came to live with them, live with her husband and live with his parents, because his parents were living with them, she became resentful towards his parents, and she conspired to have him get rid of them. She lied, and she would um, make a, make uh, a mess in the house and blame it on the, her old blame it on his parents, who were blind. And so, so she kept nagging him to get rid of her, her blind his blind parents. And eventually, he, not being a terribly wise individual at the time, this would have been many many eons ago. So he wasn't a terribly evil person, but he wasn't terribly wise either. Um, you know, in fact, in fact, was somewhat evil in a, in a sense that he went along with it and decided that he would kill his parents. And so he took them on a long trip, said they were going to visit uh, some relatives, and when they got somewhere in the forest, because his parents were blind, 
he started making lots of noise and 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 uh, shouting that there were bandits and and that they should run and he, they told him to run. His parents said, "Oh, save yourself! Don't worry about us." His parents were actually incredibly nice, you know. Uh, besides the choosing a, a poor, uh, making a poor choice of wife for their son, they were actually quite quite good people. You know, they immediately thought, thinking of their son and telling him to run, save yourself. But it was all just a ruse, and uh, he ended up taking a stick and beating them to death and discarding their bodies and going on his way. So that's the story. And because of such a monstrous act, he suffered torment for number, num numerous hundreds of thousands of years in hell. And thereafter, because the fruit of his evil deed was not yet exhausted in a hundred successive existences, he was beaten and pounded to pieces in like manner and so met death. And this is just the ending of it. And then he gives the verse and says, there are ten ways by which one suffers. I would argue that there's probably more. I mean, it, it would be odd to think that there were only these ten ways, but Buddha's giving a, you know, it's a great thing that he gives us this list of ten, gives us a really sort of a perspective on this, the sorts of things, it reminds us of the sorts of things, because all of these are easy to understand, even in this life, right? If you do evil deeds, bad things are going to happen to you. If, if anyone had found out that he had killed his parents, terrible things would have happened. Many of these things would have happened. You know, There would have been mobs and his house would have been burnt to the ground. Uh, or the king or the government would, of course, put him in prison. Or if, even if no one found out, there would be whispers of slander and people would, he would lose his stature. His, he would go crazy, of course. Anyone who kills their parents would lose their mind the potential and the great sickness that comes. All of these things happen even in this life. Forget about future existence. Evil does, evil brings evil. Good brings good and evil brings evil. There's no question. So, um, the, the, the lesson here is obviously about not doing evil deeds and about the consequences of evil. But what's interesting, I suppose, specifically about this is, is how it relates to past and future existences. I mean, this is where Buddhism, in my experience, comes after, under a great amount of criticism. Because, you know, if you, if you limit karma to this life, then, well then, all that I've said is, is understandable. But the idea that somehow, millions of years later, uh, a, a person can still suffer from something they did in a, in a past life, seems incomprehensible to people, but it's really a cheap shot in a sense, and I find that the people who, who tend to attack Buddhism for this are the people who don't really want to understand Buddhism at all, they just want to find something to criticize, especially when, I, when we say that Buddhism is, doesn't rely on belief. They say, well, what about belief in karma? That's the first thing, I've heard this many times. And it's not really a fair criticism but it's based on a really a, a, a superficial and, and you know, n not really a, a adequate understanding of, of karma. Um, because we know and we see how karma, how, how our, our deeds, our ethical and unethical deeds, affect our lives in the immediate future. Um, we can see how they affect our minds on the one hand, so they drive us crazy and cause us to be, become evil and evil people. Um, but how they also affect the universe around us, and they, they change fundamentally our, our lives and our experience. They change the universe around us. They change our place in the universe. They change our course in samsara. We can see that. Anyone can see that. Right? This is a good example. You kill your parents. Don't think that you're going to be able to live your life in any way the same as before you did. This is a mistake people make. They think they can commit an evil deed and continue on as they were. Absolutely doesn't work that way in so many ways. 
even in, in, in more fundamental ways than we might understand, because of the power of the mind, because of how the universe is kept together based on experience, based on the mind. My mind, your mind, our minds are the fabric of the universe from a Buddhist perspective. And this is, of course, where we might have an argument as to what is the fabric of the universe. From Buddhist point of view, it's based on experience, which is based on the mind. It's not based on the material. The material is completely dependent on experience. Quantum physics has something to say about that, I would argue. Um, so, uh, when you affect someone else, when you hurt someone else, you, you tear at the very fabric of reality. Not just your own mind, but your own mind, of course, is affected by that. But, but also the, the, you know, the minds of others. And, and so, uh, it's simply a paradigm or, or a claim of laws of nature. In the same way as gravity or electricity um, or to say the weather works. You know, if you want to predict the weather, you can predict it within a day or two. You can even go up to seven days. But the further off you go, the more it becomes conjecture. And yet you can still say that a well, obviously, I mean, it, it doesn't even take a leap of faith to suggest that a, um, a, a, a weighty event, like say a, a volcano or something, um, is going to have far-reaching consequences of a similar type. You know, a, a volcano erupting will have specific consequences and a specific effect on the weather. You, you can't exactly predict what, but you can predict that it will. And, and no one's going to say, oh yeah, well, you know, that's just your belief. Well, no, not really. I mean, we know how systems work. We know how physical systems work. Now, a Buddhist meditator knows how mental systems work. They can see how our actions affect our mind, affect the minds of others. If you kill someone, you're affecting their mind. You're affecting the minds of a great many people. You're affecting the way you relate to others. You're setting yourself up for further bad karma based on your habits. And all of that is going to have repercussions. It's different from the physical, physical um, reality, but it's no less complicated. Um, but because it's based on, on intentions and reactions and habits and memories, it can come back and bite you and it does come back and bite you, you know, many, many, uh, you know, gr great many times and, and, and many, many years later, because it doesn't have anything really to do with time. It has to do with, with the mind and how the mind evolves. So if you cling to something, and if other people cling to it, it's certainly going to have an effect. Now, for Moggallana, here was the end of his clinging. He was no longer clinging to it. But his, his past, you know, the, 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 the effect that it had uh, was, had already been set in motion. This is sort of the interesting realization that karma isn't just about the mind. You can be pure. And this is the great, the great thing to realize is that, uh, you know, the, the important and weighty thing to realize is that you can't escape karma. Um, you, you can't be ensured of escaping your bad karma. And it doesn't mean that a person who experiences bad uh, karma, or the results of bad karma, is a bad person. It means that there was something that set this in motion, or maybe many, many things, right? And that's another thing, is you can't point to one karma and say this is the cause. Because, of course, we commit karma all the time. We're constantly affecting our own minds, changing our own minds, and we're constantly affecting the world around us. Every time we say something to someone else, every time we do something, we're changing their opinions about us. You know, maybe if we continuously act like a, a jerk or, or act in evil ways, eventually something will snap and someone will, will attack us or, or hurt us or do something terrible to us in return, uh, which is, you would call the ripening of karma, but it might be the ripening of many, 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 many karmas. So it's, it's complicated, and it's, you know, it's more complicated than the Buddha is suggesting here. And the Buddha, of course, taught on many occasions how complicated it was. He said, you can't really understand, but 
and this is certainly the case. You know, you can you can look at this and say, well, this happens in this life. But the 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 important thing, and it is important, is that the fact that it happens, it can happen in future lives, which which translates to the fact that the things happen to us in this life can be caused by it can be. Um, a result of, of past deeds, you know, deeds from a past life. It's simply a extrapolation. It's not a leap of faith. It's just the, the coming to the logical conclusion that the deeds that we do, you know, and the effect that, that our deeds have doesn't suddenly disappear just because of what we call death. Because death doesn't change anything. I mean, that's really the point, I think, and, and the hard thing for people to understand is that it's not that Buddhists believe in reincarnation or rebirth, it's that we don't believe in death. Death itself is just a concept, because the body is just a concept. The physical world is just a conglomeration of experiences. Our experiences are what is the underlying fabric of reality, and that doesn't change when you die. You don't suddenly get a clean slate and a new mind. That's not how rebirth works. It's completely based on past experiences, as is everything else about our experience. So, lots of bad things happen to bad people. That's the point. Uh, and it's also, you know, what, how it really, really works for us is that we um, we understand that many of the, the consequences or the, the difficulties and problems that we face in this life don't mean that we're bad people. They're a sign that we've made mistakes in the past, and we've all made mistakes in the past. Of course, we all know that we've done terrible things, and in our past lives maybe we did other terrible things. It doesn't mean we're a terrible person. It doesn't mean we're terrible people. This isn't something you should, you should look down upon people because bad things happen to them, saying, oh yes, you must be terrible. We've all done it. We've all been there. Some of us are still feeling the repercussions of it. What's important, of course, is our reactions, our new karma. You now, what's important is these heretics somehow picking up or becoming a part of this and finding this weakness, and, and not even consciously perhaps, but being a, you could argue, being sort of a tool of the laws of nature, you know, somehow picking up on this. There's a, some part of reality that somehow got it in these guys' heads. You know, maybe in past lives one of them was a relative of of Moggallana and, and so was suspicious and and de developed, you know, or whatever, you know, and, and there's no, you don't have to be specific. There's a sense that the universe conspires against those who do evil deeds, which is how nature works, you know, there are, there are consequences of evil deeds. Even the fact that Moggallana uh, would have felt guilty about it, would have been, been, been haunted by this, evil deed would cause him to change his universe, change his reality, and be born in situations that would cause him to suffer as a result, out of guilt, out of fear, out of anger, out of cruelty, out of all the evil that comes from evil. Um, but the point is that these, these ascetics didn't have to act on it, these other uh, religious people. They're the real evil doers. You know, and they're the ones who sort of showed us how the law of karma works by doing the evil deed and having evil things happen to them right in that life. And not, I mean, and then, see, the point is that not only in that life, these evil evil doers, you might think they got off easy, you know, dying once. Um, or, or sometimes you might think people get off easy. They just are, are put to death, right, the death sentence. People think, well, the death penalty is actually quite humane. It actually doesn't, it doesn't really make up for the cruel deeds that people do. Um, but it's merely a very small part of the evil consequences. And that's the point, is that we should not do evil deeds. So there's much to be learned here about um, how karma works. But of course as meditators our focus should be on our mind states. It should be focused on our learning about the very building blocks that make up and create karma on a, on a momentary level. How our 
greed, anger, and delusion affects both our habits of mind and the state of our body. Uh, it affects our, men our physical health, our mental health. It affects our relationships with the people around us. And how this has real and lasting repercussions. It can change your life. If you do good deeds, it can change your life in a good way. It does change your life in a good way. If you do evil deeds, it changes your life in a bad way. Change your whole universe. Set you on the wrong path. Even lead you to hell. And therefore we work not to worry about... We work two ways. To become um, patient and be able to bear the consequences of past evil deeds without reacting to them, without creating new karma. And we work on our, our minds. We work on the causes of unwholesome karma to make ourselves better people. I mean, this is all reasonable. You don't have to have any belief for this. If a person is unwilling to believe the sorts of things that happen from past lives or happen in future lives, it's not really important because it's all just an extrapolation of what we know to be true and what we can easily verify through our meditation, that deeds have consequences. Ethics. Ethics is very real and very much a part of reality. That's one of the great lessons that Buddhism has to offer to the world. So that's our teaching today. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, wishing you all the best.